yes, Brian Corbin with us today. He is a distributor with Royal Global, and he's based out of Honolulu, Hawaii. So thank you so much for being here with us today. No, oh, thanks for having me. Of course. Um, so just want to ask you some questions and get some more insight into the company as a whole. So we might as well start with um, kind of its beginnings and how it originated, kind of going into also um, the design concept for the instruments a little bit, um, some of the more broader things and maybe getting into specifics as well. Sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, Royal Global uh, has been around since around 2007. It's actually founded by a guy named Yuan Gao, who, who currently lives around Boston. Um, but he was originally from China, but a really, really fantastic clarinet player. Um, I mean, probably he's too humble to admit it, but but definitely, you know, in the, in the top uh, category of clarinet players. And he studied with, you know, in Belgium and, and with a lot of the top uh, clarinet players in the world, and including uh, Jonathan Kohler in Boston. And so um, the company actually started around 2007 with, with the help of Jonathan Kohler um, and, and Yuan Gao, was using, um, you know, a lot of the resources and things that he kind of picked up from his world travels to start the company. In the very beginning, Royal Global, um, like like many other, you know, sort of craftsmen and, and other brands, um, he was using instruments that other manufacturers, other factories were making. And effectively, what he was doing uh, was hand finishing them. So he would get some parts from, from factories um, and, you know, for his own, uh, you know, company and he was kind of hand finishing them but when you do that there's a lot of work involved and you really can only do uh, a few a year um uh, you know at that level think of some of the other well-known clarinet makers in the world they don't produce a ton of clarinets when you can make them like that so you know really it started off um even before the clarinets with just things like barrels and bells um you and gal worked with with jonathan kohler to uh you know make a a bell and a barrel and like a lot of clarinet manufacturers, believe it or not, you know, starting with accessories is kind of the, the, way, the way you get in the game in terms of having people play on, on your stuff. And eventually, you and Gal realized, wait a second, you know, we can really uh, ex expand. And, and over the next several years, he was growing his accessory lines. He was, you know, hand finishing things in Boston on the lathe, you know, as well as those um, other, other parts. And several years ago, I want to say around 2015, um, he actually, uh, you know, built his own facilities after learning everything he could uh, from, from his prior work. And that's the Royal Factory um, that we talk about today. It's actually multiple facilities. Um, Yuan Gao, of course, originally is from, from China. But sometimes when we think about, you know, these Chinese uh, makers, what we have to realize is it's not really about where it's made, right? It's about who's making them. And, and even though he's an American citizen with, uh, you know, a factory in China, the most important thing is quality control and that kind of thing. You know, in terms of the instrument design, his, his original design for a clarinet was the classical limited, which I know uh, you guys stock as well. And that's a really great instrument uh, for the price. In terms of the concept, you know, it's really sort of based on, um, I can get into trouble for saying this a little bit, but it's really kind of based on that traditional um, American sound that we that we think of, um, but that doesn't always mean that that's what people sound like on it. It's got a little bit of a larger bore than maybe most of the typical uh, French bore style clarinets that we play, um, and and that clarinet was really designed to be a professional level instrument, but at a good price. Um, and then of course from there, as you know, the company grew, uh, as the wood started to age even more, which we can talk about a little bit later, that's when we are able to bump up and, and, and make the, the other models. So really the concept in terms of the design is make a variety of instruments that people can find something that they like, well-built, you know, well in tune, um, you know, try to make the best compromises as possible on the instrument uh, and, and charge a fair price, you know, a, a value that we think represents the quality of the instrument. Um, and, and not, not really anything, anything else. Right. Gotcha. Great. Yeah. I've, what I found, and we can talk more later again about, you know, me and Tori and what we've kind of feel and hear when we're playing the instruments, but the intonation for sure is such an important thing. And, and the price, frankly, is you're right. The classical limited is such a, such a great price for that high quality of an instrument that you don't really get with um, a lot of the other makers. So 
That's cool. Um, a little bit more specifically about the bore design. I mean, we don't have to go into you know specific measurements or anything, but um, talking about the the polycylindrical bore, which we, a lot of us might know about, but just maybe to kind of go over again. Um, and then also with the barrel, the reverse taper, and how that affects the sound too. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we always see this uh, polycylindrical bore thing thrown around in, in the clarinet world. And most of us know, right, it, it came popularized uh, by Buffet with the R13, right? Still the standard, I think, um, at least in this country, maybe in the world, but, but certainly still the standard bore, standard instrument. Um, and and it, was a, it was a really great thing. Uh, effectively, without getting into, into you know, two specifics, um, a polycylindrical bore, it's sort of like um, putting a bore within a bore um, and, and, or putting something inside of something else. And we actually do this, you know, I do this with my barrels, believe it or not, but you can actually um, ream, if you do it by hand, you can actually ream a bore to uh, a certain specifications, and then you can go back and ream it again. And then only part of that bore has been changed and the other part is still the original bore. Um, I heard an analogy one time, someone talk about um, imagining a, a, a coffee can and then you put a, a soup can inside of a coffee can um, and, and then another soup can inside of that, that uh, soup can. And instead of don't think about the outside, think about simply the inside. Um, a little confusing, but really, it's just simply that it's not one bore, it's, it's multiple bores, or some people will call it steps. It's a tapered step bore. Depending on how it's polished in certain clarinets, you could actually even look down the bore of the upper joint. It's almost always the upper joint that we're talking about. And you might even be able to see, especially on older clarinets that have been played a lot, you can even see a, a sort of a, a ring where the, the bore starts to change. So, the, the benefits are huge when we talk about sound um, and some intonation and things. So that's what we talk about when we talk about polycylindrical bore. And most of the clarinets that we, um, you know, that we see from most makers, most brands are polycylindrical bores with, with some exceptions of people kind of going back to the old days and, and bringing back, um, you know, things before that and, and, and then reinventing them as well. So again, that's, we're mostly talking about the upper joint. When we talk about tapers and barrels, once again, this reverse taper, that's, a, that's the word that everybody uses, right? Um, and it's kind of a misnomer. I'm not sure why we call it reverse taper rather than just taper. But most of us know this because of Hans Minnick, right? When you hear Hans Minnick, you know, um, we sort of attribute at least the popularization of the tapered bore to him. And what it effectively means at the most base level is that the bore starts one size and then it gets smaller. I mean, that's the, the very most basic definition uh, you know, we, can, we can talk you know, talk about. And the benefits are big. It tends to focus the sound a little bit easier. It tends to improve the tuning, for example, the twelfths that we experience on clarinets, right? There's no clarinet, at least that I've ever played, that's perfectly in tune. It's a compromise. Um, but there, these are the things that we do to try to improve those those things. Um, when you talk about things like response, it's because the bore size is different at the bottom of the barrel than it is at the top of the upper joint. Um, some people might might think that it would be better to have all of the joints be the same size. And indeed, there are some people who uh, really believe that the way you match a mouthpiece in a barrel and a clarinet is to get all those bores to match up. Um, but you know, without fighting that, it's just simply there, there are some things that can be improved with, with that taper. So um, you, you end up creating what's called the choke. And that choke, meaning that there's a step all of a sudden the bore is smaller than it gets larger or the other way around. That's what creates a difference in things like response and the way we feel the instrument. So certainly in the Royal Global barrels, including the adjustable barrel, um, there is a reverse taper. Every one of my own handmade barrels that I do custom are, are reverse taper. I'm not sure if anybody's doing anything else these days other than experimenting because it works really well. Um, and one thing you'll learn about the clarinet community is when something works really well, they, they typically tend to, to, to stick with it for, uh, for better or worse. Um, and for now, that's, I don't think it's going away anytime soon. Uh, our next set of questions, which is about um, specifically the models, the Classical Limited, the Polaris and the Firebird. Um, and this is where me and Tori can both kind of talk about what we find, and, and you can also touch on um, the differences there a little bit too. 
for, um, you know, when you talk about the different models, you can think of it this way. Each model from the classical laminate going to the Polaris and then going up to the Firebird has a slightly smaller bore at, at some point. Okay, so, and that's what gives us a lot of the differences in terms of the resistance, uh, in terms of the tuning um, and, and the overall hold on the sound. What you might find is that some of the bores, uh, for example, the classical limited typically tends to sound a lot more monotone than, than some of the other instruments for when people play them. And, and usually that's because uh, you know, the, the bore design specifically is slightly larger bore. If we're talking again specifically in the upper joint, usually at the lower part of the upper joint is really where this taper can be measured uh, you, you know, to, be, to be smaller. As you go up the Polaris, which does have a slightly smaller bore design, but there are some other differences as well, like bear, bell flare at the lower joint, that kind of thing. Uh, the Polaris clarinet tends to be a little more colorful than the classical limited, um, but some people, and a little more flexible for some people, but some people will still also say, you know, that, that it has uh, a little more ring to the sound. Um, a little, people call it ping, a little bit of a ping to the sound. There's so many other variables, right? The wood as well, which we can talk about is a major difference. But the Firebird, which, you know, is kind of the flagship model. This is what everybody is really getting excited about and for good reason. Um, has not only a, an even smaller bore uh, at a specific point in that upper joint, it also has other changes. And of course, keep in mind with these smaller bores, you have to move tone holes and, and other things to compensate. So you can't just put the same keys from a Polaris on a Firebird, they, it doesn't work, um, you know, for, for example. So there's always a compromise. You're always trying to decide, well, do I want in tune throat tones? and maybe a little high upper clarion, or, or do we like our, our little bit lower throat tones and like our upper clarion to be spot on? And all of those things are, are affected uh, by the bore and can also be hand tuned um, you know, after the fact. That's, that's not an uncommon, uncommon thing at all. So typically, just to summarize with the instruments, as you go up in terms of the model, um, you're going to see a slightly smaller bore, again, at least in certain parts of the instrument. Um, which which gives it its characteristic sounds. Yeah, and you kind of mentioned, um, you touched on this just a little bit, um, exactly what you're describing are definitely some things that, you know, us as uh, getting familiar with the brand, um, we've really, you, you know, kind of honed in on and have been able to um, really gravitate towards more of a clarification on what those models mean, right? Because we can refer people as much as possible to to you and your um, your sites and all of the information that you have. But when it comes down to it, right, it's about what does this clarinet feel like? And unfortunately, or fortunately, um, sometimes we have to compare it to other models, right? And so we're trying to kind of figure out what that is. So your explanation of kind of detailing it a little bit more is so valuable and hopefully people can really kind of understand you know what's all involved it's not just about the bore um, and you're probably going to tell us a little bit about kind of the the wood quality and what does that really mean in terms of the clarinet world um, right. but I think you I think you hit all of those models that's exactly what I was going to say is you know obviously you know them very well <laughs> but um, yeah yeah, between the classical, the Polaris, and the Firebird, those explanations of kind of what's happening inside of why it becomes more focused, I think it's just really invaluable. So that's really good. Right. So sp speaking of the wood, what, what would be the difference that people could get from each one of those models? And what does that mean? Yeah, so, yeah absolutely. Well, one of the great things about, um, you know, Royal Global, and, and just to be clear, by the way, I, I'm the distributor for Royal Global. But I am really like, uh, I, I love all of the brands. Like I, I love seeing this. I'm a really big brand diversity guy. So I have to just say, even if, if, if maybe this hurts me with my Royal affiliation, I still play other brand clarinets sometimes just because I like the differences in the variety. Um, yeah. So you're right when we talk about comparing it to other models, we just simply do that because other people know these models really well, right? Um, I played an R13 my entire life. I still have them. I don't anticipate giving it up anytime soon, even though now I play a Firebird. Um, and so when people ask me, what's the closest to your R13? 
I can say, well, I, I think it's this model or that model. Um, coincidentally, I, I think it's usually the Polaris, um, but not always. So just to say that, you know, I, I think we, we should understand that every manufacturer is a little bit different. And Royal is hasn't been around for a hundred years or, or more. So some of these things we're learning how to uh, explain them to people because it's not just about marketing, right? It's easy for us to come up with a marketing scheme and say, um, you know, this or that, but let's try to be more specific. Um, in terms of the wood, the wood quality is really important. Um, unfortunately, people will often attribute things like wood cracking specifically to like this model cracks all the time or this manufacturer wood cracks all the time. And the first thing I always tell people is back up. This <laughs> thing is, was a tree at some point. It's a piece of wood. If you expect, you know, a clarinet to never crack, then, then don't buy a wooden clarinet. Um, I, I really do think that cracks are a little bit overblown, but, but let's talk about how we choose the wood and, and why it's important, how to try to prevent that. First thing is Royal Global has done a really great job of, um, you know, making sure they have a great stock of aged uh, of wood, naturally aged wood. And what that means is, is even though we, you know, most manufacturers have to at some point use um, a kiln, which is basically like an oven to dry the wood. Uh, one of the great things, depending on how you look at it, is there's not, uh, you know, a demand that really outpaces the wood that we have prepared and are constantly preparing at the Royal Global Factory. So what you're going to see, I visited the factory, you know, several of the facilities, and I was just like, my, my jaw dropped to the floor when I walked into the room and saw all of these just pieces of wood just sitting and aging. But the big thing is the, the classical limited is gonna be used, uh, is gonna be made with wood that's aged minimum three years, three to five years. So there is some, uh, there is some fluctuation, but the minimum is gonna be generally three years, you know, completely dried uh, wood. The Polaris tends to be uh, minimum five, um, you know, five to even seven. And then you're gonna look at about seven to nine for the Firebird. So um, of course, what that means is there's usually, we usually have a lot more classical limiteds than we do Polaris clarinets. We usually have a lot more Polaris than we do Firebirds, right? Um, and then you can take that up the line even to the base clarinets, you know, which take even more, you know, time uh, to, to produce. So the big thing is A, the aging, the natural drying and the aging is really important because what it does is it allows the wood to properly dry out evenly and regulate itself so that when you reintroduce moisture into it or break in the clarinet, as we often call it, um, it's going to accept it a little bit, a little bit better. One of the things uh, that separates all of the wood, besides just the simple aging process, which, um, you know, aging it for longer doesn't make it a better piece of wood necessarily, uh, is we actually, uh, there's a, you know, you weigh all the wood. So all of the wood's actually weighed. Um, in terms of mass, and then also uh, density. And these are things that you can find with very simple measurement tools. So what you're gonna find is typically the classical limited has um, a little bit lighter wood compared to, for example, the Firebird. Um, we separate the wood as, as it's being uh, processed into these batches of these weigh this much, and you know, let's put these over here for, for this clarinet and then you know, vice versa for another. So that's really, really crucial. A lot of people will, will use things like wood color or wood grain to determine wood quality. And there are, there are some reasons for that. And then there's also uh, some things you have to watch out for. For one thing, typically, uh, and I'm also a woodworker, so I've learned a lot about this just on my own messing things up, but typically the lighter wood um, it comes from oftentimes a different place than the darker wood. So, you know, really the closer you get to the core of the tree, if you will, the denser, the harder the wood and often the darker the wood. Um, when you talk about sap wood versus heartwood, you know, the sap wood of a grenadilla tree of an African blackwood, you know, tree is typically a lot lighter than the uh, heartwood, which is darker. So um, you might often, and you definitely will, see typically darker wood on the, the upper models, just simply because color can sometimes correlate with mass and density, but not always. I mean, I, I just sent out the Polaris clarinet that almost looks like it was a piece of Coca-Bolo. 
Um, but it played beautifully and the weight was there and all the measurements were proper. So um, you can't always use color for that. In terms of the gray though, this is an interesting one because I think typically people associate straighter grain um, and it's true, right? Straighter grain with, uh, you know, maybe more stable or stronger wood. A lot of times people want to avoid things like knots, um, which I kind of like, but I understand why people don't. Um, and so, yes, this, that's another consideration. The grain is really important, but I have to be honest and say, I think the, the straightness or the curviness of the grain um, is maybe not as important as people give, you know, uh, you know, give it credit for. I think things like uh, poricity, you know, is the grain more open or closed? That can have a really big impact. Um, and so all of those things go into, you know, deciding which model is going to get, you know, which, which would. And that's really, really uh, crucial to making sure that, you know, we can uphold our warranty, which is the full three-year warranty, um, you, you know, which includes cracking and any, and any other, you know, manufacturer defects. So uh, we, we feel that it's a really great process. We feel really strong uh, about the process that, that's being, uh, you know, used. And while clarinets do crack, there's just no way to avoid it. Um, we do find that because we're not producing trillions of clarinets a year and we're making sure that the wood is first finished, that it holds up pretty well. Yeah, and as, I mean, as you know, from, you know, being on the repair side of things too, and with us, you, you, we see that over and over again, right? The more porous, um, if, you, if it looks like a crack, but it's actually not because it's the grain of the wood that's just so deep. Um, those are things you have to kind of be, be cautious of. So when we you know, do selecting and stuff like that, those are definitely things to pay attention to. So it would be really interesting to, to know how much of that wood, like you said, it was jaw, drop, jaw dropping when you saw it. Um, how much of that actually makes it to a clarinet? You know what I mean? Like how does it, how much of that really goes goes into it? Because it, it's not all gonna be equal, right? So Absolutely kind of not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is the unfortunate part and this is why, um, and maybe we'll talk about this this later, but this is why other manufacturers um, have become really successful selling non-wood instruments or composite instruments, and why World Global is is dead. that's already been in the research and development for a long time as well, because there's waste involved, right? And so um, I can't speak specifically for Royal Global, but I can tell you that me personally and my company, you know, we contribute to conservation efforts for the wood um, specifically. You know, it's not, it, it's threatened, but I, I think it's a little overblown when people talk about the endangered species of African blackwood. I, I don't want to get into that too much, but um, certainly we need to be concerned about the, about the future and about maintaining that. But that being said, um, I can tell you just from my own personal shop, uh, you know, we can have somewhere upwards of 20, 30% waste um, at any given time, which is a lot of money, um, you know, and, and resources. That's part of the reason why clarinets are the price they are. Um, so now luckily for me, I try to recycle as much of that waste as I can into other little knickknacks and whatnot. But for, for ma major manufacturers, it's it's a little bit tougher to do that. So yeah, a lot of that would um, you know probably won't make it, and that's the nature of what we're doing. But hopefully, the processes that we're taking uh, will try to limit that as much as possible. Right, that makes sense. So what about the? Um, you just mentioned that there maybe there's some research going on with a, a lined option or you know something that's composite. Is there anything in the works? Uh, yes, there's there are things that have been in the works for for quite a while. Um, you know, again, there are other manufacturers who very successfully have have done this. I think what Royal is focusing on mostly, rather than the lined option, which is you still have to use African blackwood for a lined option, and by the way, it can still crack um, because what you're actually doing is you're you're lining the inner bore. Um, and, and typically speaking, when you talk about cracks, you're talking about the difference of external factors versus the expansion of the bore. Um, so typically when we, we see cracks on the clarinet, they most of the time they actually don't go through the bore. And, and most of the time they're, they're, they're from the outside um, and they may go through a tone hole or something. Um, so that being said, even with those lined options, you still have to do things like maybe synthetic tone holes if you really want it, you know, Want, to, want it to be better. So Royal's kind of focusing on a couple of things and I, I don't want to say too much and get myself in trouble, 
Um, but, but certainly I can say that in terms of, uh, of a composite um, and in terms of, of, a, of what we think we can consider a professional quality synthetic, um, I, I think those are all in the works. You know, you may even see something potentially as early as this year, um, you know, crossing, crossing my fingers. But I'll just step back and say, um, look, I, I love wood. And I think when we talk about, I talk with a lot of older clarinet players, people that have been in the profession for a long time. And, you know, you, they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You know, these people are constantly telling me how superior wood is and how the sound of the wood, there's nothing like it. And um, there's just nothing, you know, and, and let me be honest, I, I really do believe that, that there is something special about the sound of the wood. But um, I've played synthetic clarinets that will blow some of the wooden ones out of the water. So there's so much more to it um, than, than just simply wood or not wood. But certainly, yes, we are on the precipice. You know, remember that, you know, Royal is still, um, you know, it's not 50 year old, 100 year old company and everything that we do in terms of research and development. I don't want to say starting from the ground up. Certainly, that's not necessarily true. Um, but we want to make sure that we do something that's that's royal specific um, and it's going to work for us. So it's definitely in the works. Um, we, we've got other things in the works as well that um, we'll let the dealers know, but I don't want to say anything right now. Um, we can maybe talk after this about some of those about some of those things. So what um, speaking of kind of dealers and, and what that means, um, you are a distributor. And how does that differ from a dealer? What does that mean for for the consumer, really? Sure. So, you know, at its base level, um, when in 2019, when Yun Gao asked me to kind of take over the distribution, essentially what it means is that, uh, you know, I purchase inventory, you know, our company, I should say, purchases inventory from Royal um, and, and the dealers are, you know, then receiving instruments uh, through us. So what that means for the consumer, uh, you know, it's 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 a little bit murky, you know, we're not a giant corporation or anything like that. So we don't have the same type of network and policies as others, but essentially what it means is that we don't do a lot of clarinet selling directly to people, especially, you know, outside of our geographic area. So for example, anybody in Hawaii, if you want a Royal Global Clarinet, Hey, come to me, we'll take care of you. Right. Um, because we are the dealer in Hawaii. Um, but in terms of, you know, let's say you're, you're in Minnesota, for example, um, and you want to buy a Royal Global Clarinet. Well, uh, we can't sell it to you specifically, or I should say we don't, we wouldn't because we would say, hey, you have a dealer, um, you know, that's within, you know, however many miles, but the point is it's, it's in your state um, that's, that can take care of you. Or if we have someone, you know, on the East Coast, well, we have these dealers here. So certainly there are certain circumstances, you know, we have no dealers in Alaska, for example, we have no dealers in California, for example. So certainly these people can, uh, you know, can contact us because when you factor in things like shipping and other costs, if you try to buy something directly from us, just to be honest, um, you know, if you're not in one of those, those dealer located areas, you're going to pay a lot more money. I mean, you're going to pay a lot more money in shipping. Um, I also have an additional fee uh, for, for setup, you know, an additional two to $250 fee that we charge that most dealers, I, I, I think, roll that in uh, to, to the price when you purchase an instrument, but, but maybe not. Uh, plus an additional, you know, other hassles and things, you know. So uh, typically speaking, it's almost always uh, better for consumers to, to go through um, a dealer because you're also going to get um, a specific type of service and, and you know, in terms of dealing with with the warranty, you're going to get probably better deals in terms of financing, um, and and typically they're going to have more stock than than I will, to be honest. And that's simply because, you know, we don't stock you know a, a bunch of clarinets. We we get the clarinets in that we need to to keep dealers stock. And so at any given time, I may only have uh, like in my in one actual day a few instruments of each model. And then maybe Tori, you call me up and say, Hey, I need to, to order uh, a few clarinets and well, that's what we've got. Um, and so, so here you go. And then I'll get more. So that being said, uh, people can still come and, and visit our showroom here in Hawaii. It's a fairly new space, but that takes planning. 
because we have to a you know i mean we're talking probably at least a month out because we need to make sure we have the stock in for you um and and typically speaking uh it, it means that even if you come here it's not going to be like going to you know one of the other big guys where you can try dozens and dozens of clarinets we're talking you might be able to hand select um depending you know at the most maybe a half dozen instruments or something of each model. So um, we do that for a couple of reasons. We, we do think it's it's better to work with your local store or someone you already have a partnership with. That being said, you know, I started my business. I spent years of hard work on the road, getting my own clients um, and working hard that way. So people that I've sold to before previous, uh, you know, relationships, they still come to me um, and, and I will still work with them. And, and um, as a repair tech, I know certain people have set up preferences. And so um, I'll typically work that way, but for the most part, we uh, we don't sell that many that many clarinets directly. If someone did want to come, first thing we would do is ask um, where where are you, uh, you know where are you from, and then we give them options of of dealers that they could you know potentially buy through. So if you set it up to come visit us in Hawaii, maybe you're just coming on vacation and you want to stop by, um, but uh, but but even so, you know you're going to need to go through one of those dealers. Um, so that they can say, okay, well, we're going to work with Brian to make sure we have these clarinets, um, you know, here ready for you to try. But, you know, one thing you just might consider is a lot of times what we can do is even uh, loan out instruments to, to dealers to try specifically for, for their clients. Now, we don't always have the stock to do this, but let's say somebody, you know, is desperate to try, you know, three model, three, at least three of a certain model, right? And maybe in your stock, you only have two. Well, you know, there's a potential where I'm assuming we know that person's going to work with you guys. We can send you an additional instrument, uh, you know, with, with no obligation to make sure that you have the choice that you think is needed. And that'll save people the hassle of trying to come out here. But I will say if money's no option, um, you know, one of your customers wanted to come out here just because it's Hawaii, then yeah, let them set it up through you. They'll, we'll line it up together. We'll schedule the appointment and then they come fake out a horn. Um, and typically the way it's going to work is, is we actually send the horn uh, to the dealer unless there was some specific authorization uh, that we received that would allow them to actually walk away with it. We do that, of course, for you know insurance purposes and to make sure that our dealers have all their all the records and whatnot straight. So yeah, people can come. It's it's a little bit of a, a of a process. If you live near a dealer, we don't have necessarily a giant list of them. But you know, if you're within you know a certain distance, or it's in your state, or maybe even 100, 200 miles, or shipping's not going to be that expensive. I, I think it's a big consideration. Yeah, for sure. I know it's a it's kind of a part of the clarinet culture now these days too for hand selecting instruments and. Um, really, at least that's what we're building our department on in our, our store, really, as a double read specialty shop, how important that is. Um, how does that kind of factor in? Um, and maybe you can kind of touch on a little bit, you know, how are the clarinets arriving to you? And, you know, because you are distributing them to the dealers right now, do you foresee that that being, you know, kind of a destination option for people if it's really kind of part of this culture of really hand selecting or the dealer is hand selecting for you, you know, how do you see those kind of going going forward? Yeah, um, you know, I think, you know, first off, it's constantly evolving a little bit as the company changes and as we grow, but um, I'll say a couple of things. You know, I, I also, you know, have been a part of, of um, hand selection processes for instruments, um, but I'm gonna just say this one thing that may be um, a little controversial, and that is I think the idea of hand selecting um, it has a little bit of, there's an extra element that needs to be, uh, you know, talked about. That element is an element of consistency in the product. And what I mean by that is the more consistent a product, and again, we're talking about a piece of wood, so there's only so many variables, you, you know, you can really uh, counteract. But if the instruments are consistently made, um, and most importantly, most importantly, if they're set up and sealing, then typically when we hand select, you're talking about very minute and subtle differences. Um, in fact, um, I, I often will see people hand select instruments and then what they'll do is they'll just take their mouthpiece and they'll just put them on a bunch of clarinets that are already you know, assembled 
And just like I mentioned before, um, I actually think that's the least effective way to hand select clarinet. I think the most effective way, if you're going to do that, is to put your mouthpiece and a barrel that you like, or, or just any barrel. It doesn't even matter if you like the barrel. Test all the instruments that way. And then what you're going to notice, uh, the same differences, but you're not going to be taking into account necessarily the barrel that comes with it. Now, that being said, you may not have the ability to mix and match barrels all the time. So yes, I understand the hand selection process makes a customer feel like they're getting the best of the best. Um, but that's assuming that there is some not great instruments in the bunch, um, which surely, surely might happen. But for me, you know, these instruments get shipped uh, to us here in Honolulu, as well as to you and Gal and the, you know, the headquarters near Boston as well. Um, so what you see is right now, because we're still in the pandemic, and we're not traveling, you know, I've been nowhere, you know, in a year, um, we're able to right now actually fulfill orders from not only here in Honolulu, but also in, in, in Boston, which right now, although no one can, you can't go there and, and select instruments there. Uh, but as of right now, because of the pandemic, we have even more instruments there than we do here in our stock. That being said, there are certain dealers, um, you know, who, as we work more with them, we learn what their preferences are, what they like about certain instruments. And if we have the stock, it's possible for me to go through and select them and say, I think this was the best one, or even you know, do some short recordings. Let's say you say, we, we wanna get a Polaris, um, but I really, you know, I, I wanna get this or that. Well, then I've got three here. Let me play test three for you. Um, and I can even send you that and say, well, we love the sound of this one or that one. Of course, your miles may vary, right? Um, but I see this moving forward, um, you, you know, where, yes, as we grow, as dealers become more comfortable, as customers start to learn more about the brand and see how we have really um, great artists and students alike playing the instruments, they might want to have, have more of an option. Um, the one benefit of, of coming here, if you do come here, is I'll probably have at least every model that we make. So maybe all the dealers may not have all of the models in stock at one time. So I see this moving forward as certainly uh, increasing the ability for people to be able to do this um, in terms of hand selecting. But I also think that um, people should feel pretty trusted and that their dealers are hopefully fighting for them in terms of making sure they're stocking the instruments um, that they like uh, with, within reason. Yeah. So are you, um, are you also between you and Yuan from receiving the instruments? Are you both still going through each one and just making sure everything's set up um, as best as it can be individually? Uh, yes and no. So for example, um, we're not gonna send you, I mean, I'm not gonna send, for at least from my shop, a clarinet that doesn't play. Um, now that being said, we recognize, and in fact, certain dealers um, and repair techs have even asked us not to uh, do this because we do recognize there's two major things. One, I hope most of the repair techs are going to go through those instruments anyway, because you may not know what happens by shipping uh, or anything else, right? So most of the repair techs are going to go through anyway. So for instruments like the classical limited, we typically don't spend that much time um, setting those up. One of the benefits is that right now, at least the classical and the Polaris, you know, all come with synthetic pads. And we typically see better rates of instrument staying and stealing in good condition with those synthetic pads as you as it moves all across the world right um, now the firebirds specifically are still you know each one of us anytime a firebird has been sold you know pretty much in this country through a dealer it's it's been seen by either me or yuan um, and, and we will you know do certain adjustments um, at least to make sure that it's good because it's a little more complicated mechanism. So when you talk about getting them from the factory, um, most people in all the factories that make clarinets in the world, most of those people aren't clarinet players, okay? So, uh, which means that most of them, they're not doing the padding work and then, you know, necessarily testing and making sure everything is, is perfect. So one benefit is that we typically will go through and just try to have the best stop. You know, sometimes, just to be honest, um, you know, we get instruments and I send them back. I, I think that there are certain ones um, I just don't particularly like. So I kind of I kind of pride myself on the fact that we keep at least the USA market, which is what we're talking about, 
stock with uh, with some of the, the the better quality instruments. So yes, there is still some hand finishing work specifically for the Firebirds, but overall they come so well set up from the factory that you're only talking about a couple of major maybe a leak or you know here or there or maybe some key noise. You have to do a couple of adjustments there, and we expect that when you receive them that you're not putting you know a lot of work and not hours of work for for setup. And we could definitely vouch for that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good. Please let me know your experience, how that's happened. I mean, yeah, it's, it's just, it's refreshing for one, um, just to be able to open it up and be able to typically, I don't think we've had more than maybe an adjustment screw or something like that, um, you know, with things sealing. So, I mean, coming from Honolulu up to Minneapolis is quite a change. So <laughs> there is yeah. bound to be some, some things, but, um, We've been pleasantly surprised, which is it speaks a lot to what you were talking about with quality and really taking the time and it, all those factors really play into, you know, what's being done. So it makes a big yeah. difference for sure. Yeah, I would definitely glad to hear that. Yeah. yeah, refreshing is a word that came to my mind as well. Of just having it's just so easy, you know. We get the clarinets and and play them, and again, yeah, maybe like a little click noise, you know, with like the levers or something, but nothing major at all. And it's it's so nice. <laughs> so that's great. Yeah, I think from a consumer standpoint too. I mean, that's also something you know to think about, right? If you're going to put all that money into an instrument, um, you don't want to have to come back six months later or you know, three months later and get the whole thing worked on again, right? So. right. And, and in fact, I'll, I'll just say that, you know, I typically recommend, or at least before Royal, I always recommended when people buy new instruments um, that if, the, if they weren't set up or upgraded from the factory, you should probably get it overhauled within the first year. And people would always look at me like I was crazy. Like, I just bought a new clarinet. Now I need to spend another 500 to to $1,000, depending on where you go to get it overhauled and I would say well yes because otherwise what you're doing is you're just gonna you know do kind of patch repairs here or there you got a torn bladder pad here or a torn bladder pad there and generally most people will warrant overhauls for longer periods of time but I don't actually recommend that anymore at least specifically with with world global clarinets because um, they if you didn't know it would look like it's an overhauled clarinet right it all new pads, synthetic pads hold up. We also, you know, just so you know, we do use um, Gore-Tex pads and some of the Firebird clarinets as, as well. So you will see some of those as well, which I actually really like those, but some people don't. So yeah, it, I'm glad to hear that it's been a good experience for you guys. And I will say that we're constantly taking feedback from dealers and trying to improve. Um, and one of the benefits of being uh, sort of a smaller manufacturer is that um, we, we are able to change and improve quickly. I mean, even small things, um, you know, someone says, well, this, this particular note does this or that. Um, we have 100% control over every one of those factors. So it's just simply a, a phone call to Yuan Gao and Royal Global to say, hey, you know, we've been getting clarinets with, with maybe um, too thin of cork here or something. Okay, well, the next batch, all of a sudden, these have been improved. And, and that's what we want to see going forward, um, you, you know, is, is better for the consumer, I think. Yeah, that's really rare. I mean, for sure. <laughs> and and the you know the detail, um, you know that goes a long way for sure. So that's great. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Brian. We really appreciate your time, and this has been so enlightening and informative, and helps give a good overview for those who don't know tons yet about World Global and the more in-depth stuff as well with the models. Um, so we look forward to talking to you uh, later on with uh, I think an artist of Royal Globals too. And thank you for being a part of our uh, clarinet event. Thank you for having me. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.